Yesterday, we were honoured to have two very special guests, as the member mentioned, on the Hill, who have been tireless advocates for action on one of two global crises the UN Secretaries of General have called for action on. One guest, Satsuko Thurlow, a survivor of Hiroshima bombing, has dedicated her life to ensuring no other community experiences that catastrophe to humanity. The first crisis, climate change, the Canadian government is beginning to tackle. The second, the nuclear threat, they are not. Yet both crises pose equally significant threats to humanity, both to our environment and to life. Nations are deeply concerned about the catastrophic humanitarian consequences posed by nuclear weapons, that the threat, like climate change, transcends national borders, has grave implications for human survival, the environment, the global economy, food security, and the health of future generations. Since my election in 2008, I've become engaged through the Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, a global association of elected officials and civil leaders advocating for nuclear disarmament. A few months back, I attended the UN negotiations for a convention on nuclear disarmament. This convention is being premised on the principles and rules of humanitarian law and is considered directly consistent with the binding terms of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Despite voting for the motion calling for Canadian engagement in these negotiations, Canada not only continues to boycott this global initiative, they are counted among the few nations who last year voted against even commencing the negotiations. Why is this troubling? Canada is a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That multilateral treaty compels our country, along with the other signatories, to negotiate and complete a convention on a nuclear ban. Nuclear weapons are the only weapons of mass destruction, as my, my colleague mentioned, not yet prohibited. Canada played a key role in global actions to ban chemical and biological weapons and landmines. Yet our government is boycotting actions to ban nuclear weapons. Do they not share the global concern that nine states possessing 15 to 17,000 nuclear weapons are determined to modernize or make easier to deploy these weapons, not dismantle them? What is puzzling if we have a Prime Minister and a government who claims to the world they're back at the UN, that they are back at the UN, that they are committed or not, whether they've signed on to the convention or not, it's another tool, it's another yardstick. A convention like that has an influence even on countries that are non-signatories. We've seen it with the landmines treaty. There are countries that, uh, like our neighbors to the south, who hadn't signed on, but the convention, the treaty, definitely influenced them. It had a huge effect on their use of landmines and elsewhere in the world, too. So it's so disappointing that Canada is not at least at the table. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Here's the debate. The Honourable Member for Edmonton Strathcona. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and it's my honour to share this time with former diplomat and my dear colleague, the member for Laurier San Marie. Yesterday, we were honoured to have two very special guests, as the member mentioned, on the Hill, who've been tireless advocates for action on one of two global crises the UN Secretaries of General have called for action on. One guest, Satsuko Thurlow, a survivor of Hiroshima bombing, has dedicated her life to ensuring no other community experiences that catastrophe to humanity. The first crisis, climate change, the Canadian government is beginning to tackle. The second, the nuclear threat, they are not. Yet both crises pose equally significant threats to humanity, both to our environment and to life. Nations are deeply concerned about the catastrophic humanitarian consequences posed by nuclear weapons, that the threat, like climate change, transcends national borders, has grave implications for human survival, the environment, the global economy, food security, and the health of future generations. Since my election in 2008, I've become engaged through the Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, a global association of elected officials and civil leaders advocating for nuclear disarmament. A few months back, I attended the UN negotiations for a convention on nuclear disarmament. This convention is being premised on the principles and rules of humanitarian law and is considered directly consistent with the binding terms of the Non-Proliferation Treaty. Despite voting for the motion calling for Canadian engagement in these negotiations, Canada not only continues to boycott this global initiative, they are counted among the few nations who last year voted against even commencing the negotiations. Why is this troubling?
Canada is a party to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. That multilateral treaty compels our country, along with the other signatories, to negotiate and complete a convention on a nuclear ban. Nuclear weapons are the only weapons of mass destruction, as my, my colleague mentioned, not yet prohibited. Canada played a key role in global actions to ban chemical and biological weapons and landmines. Yet our government is boycotting actions to ban nuclear weapons. Do they not share the global concern that nine states possessing 15 to 17,000 nuclear weapons are determined to modernize or make easier to deploy these weapons, not dismantle them? What is puzzling if we have a prime minister and a government who claims to the world they're back at the UN, that they are committed to a multilateral approach to address global crises. They seem to find that of value on climate change. Why not on the threat of nuclear war? Last March, a majority of nations gathered in New York at the UN to draft a convention on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. I went to New York to observe firsthand these negotiations. What I heard in the speeches by state delegates, including, for example, the Netherlands and Ireland, was a profound concern with the threat posed by nuclear weapons and a determination to stand together to call for their prohibition. It's anticipated that a final version of this convention will be completed this July. In the wake of this government's decision to boycott, I traveled to hear firsthand and was inspired by the strength of commitment to these nations to pursue a common end to the nuclear weapons. The very purpose of the UN, as pointed out by UN Secretary General Guterres, is to prevent war and human suffering. We are reminded in a book by former Ambassador for Disarmament, Douglas Roche, that the UN Charter begins by saying that the purpose of the organization is to, in quotes, take effective measures for the prevention and removal of threats to peace, end of quotes. Former UN Secretary Ban Ki-moon issued a five-point proposal for nuclear disarmament, including a call to ratify and enter into force a comprehensive nuclear test ban treaty. In 2010, this call, as my colleague mentioned, was unanimously endorsed by this place on a motion by the NDP calling for Canadian engagement in these negotiations for a global convention and to kick-start a Canadian diplomatic initiative to prevent nuclear proliferation. As my colleague also has pointed out, many have expressed support for this convention, including the Interparliamentary Union, hundreds of orders of Canada, and many former Canadian diplomats. It's noteworthy that the Liberal Party at the recent convention adopted a resolution calling on this government to convene a conference to commence negotiations. Well, that action is already happening absent this government. What excuse has this government given for refusing to participate in the negotiations? They argue that they are engaged in discussions for a FISAN ban, to, that is to put a stop to the production of new fissile materials that could be used to make nuclear weapons. However, unlike the open and transparent process at the General Assembly to negotiate a convention, that process is behind closed doors and requires consensus. And there is little likelihood that those opposed, for example, Pakistan, China, Russia, Iran, Israel, Egypt, will agree, and to date have not. These nations, I am advised, have huge supplies of fissile material, regardless of any ban eventually negotiated for no new projection. It is not too late for Canada to come forward and join world nations in pursuit of this humanitarian action. Negotiations recommence this month in New York for the sake of our children, for the sake of the planet. We implore this government to step forward, to join the efforts of nations threatened by nuclear weapons, not those determined to retain and potentially deploy them.